again and welcome back or shall I say welcome if you join me for the very first time. This is the Aquilani History Podcast um, where we look at world um, history from African perspective and um, to my returning viewers or listeners I say a very big welcome back to you. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for your support and thanks for making it to the third episode of this series on the history of the Sakoto Caliphate. I'd like to say welcome to everyone from all over the world, wherever it is that you're listening from. It's a cold, uh, dreary November night where I am recording this intro. I hope wherever you are, it's warm and beautiful and magical with, you know, golden roses and purple sunflowers and all that magical stuff. Um, yeah, so straight into today's um, episode is the third in, and final episode in a series on the history of the Sakoto Caliphate. Um, we left episode two at a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, Caliph Atahiru has declared war on the British Empire. Brave. In this episode, we're going to be looking at things from the other perspective. So a little bit of context from the European um, perspective and would we'll examine a series of events that have led to the brink of war and indeed war. Yeah, there will be war. So without further ado, let's dive in into the final episode and see how this concludes. I'll be listening. Tell the infidel that we did not invite him to interfere with our problems. He has his religion and we have ours. And as my predecessor, Caliph Abdul Rahman said, the only relationship that can exist between a believer and the infidel is war. At-Tahiru was quite right about the writing being clear. Far away, over the Sahara and beyond the Mediterranean, it had been a time of great change in Europe as well. The preceding century had seen conflicts such as the Seven Years and Napoleonic Wars, which significantly altered the balance of power. It was a period of immense change, of exploration and expansion. With slave trade being banned and the rise of industrialization, the African hinterland was being explored for its abundant potential in natural resources. European powers previously restricted to the coasts were keen to have access to the heartland territories for several reasons. To harness its raw materials, secure legitimate trade and shipping routes, have annexes for military bases and as diplomatic chess pieces, the reasons were as myriad as they were complex. To avoid unnecessary conflict between war-weary European powers on the African continent, 14 nations and empires including Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, Britain, Denmark, Spain, the United States of America, Russia, Portugal, Austria-Hungary, Sweden, Norway and the Ottoman Empire met in Berlin in 1884 to 1885 to delineate the rules for establishing spheres of influence and protectorates in Africa. They determined amongst one another that no European nation could claim ownership or protection over any African territory without having a real presence and control there. That is to say, the land must be effectively occupied. This meant they must have evidence of trade agreements or treaties of protection with the native kingdoms and have an administrative setup on ground, like a consulate or residency office to govern the area, and if necessary, by force. No African nation was represented. Individual countries would strike up individual deals based on competing interests. For instance, Britain and France would agree in 1890 that Britain lays claim to all that fairly belonged to Salquito, whilst France's interests would be to regions around the western bend of the River Niger. It was all loosely defined and each European power had to move fast to effectively occupy areas in the spheres of interest. Similar agreements between Britain and Germany divvied up the Adamawa region. The race was on. 
Some countries were more direct and militant in their approach, less shy in forcing conflict to achieve control of their spheres of interest. The British initially favoured trade and treaty brokering. At the end of the day, these treaties were basically paper tools which could be used as evidence while negotiating claims with other European powers, a proof of address of sorts if you like. The basic structure of these treaties offer exclusive trade and protection, usually against local hostile neighbours or other European powers in return for ceding sovereignty. Now why would a sovereign sign such a deal? Well firstly, they were often written in English and even though they had to be translated and explained, the translators often had to be quite tactical towing a difficult line between the powerful foreign employer and the native, often semi-divine authoritarian monarch. One translator confessed that he did not understand that ceding sovereignty meant surrendering independence and that even if he did, he dared not mention it to his king as it was too outrageous. Even when fully understood, cooperation from local rulers was encouraged through inducements in the form of money, weapons and promise of protection from rivals. And if that did not work, they were coerced into signing by military force or threat of one. A certain Lord Lugard once said that these treaties were utter frauds and no man, if he understood them, would sign them. The very same Lugard had been mandated by the British to consolidate their interests in present day Nigeria. He had recently taken over the armed forces of the Royal Niger Company, the British agents for administering their interests in the Niger area. Soon after, the company and its possessions were purchased by and was now directly under the control of the British Empire. The British and their agents had been making steady gains in the areas around the Niger. Lagos had been bombed into submission in 1861. The Yoruba states had been embroiled in a century-long civil war and the British in the name of arbitration eventually subdued them. The Bini Kingdom, the Aru Confederacy and the All Rivers had met the same fate. In the north, the Royal Niger Company had taken advantage of the infighting between the Emir of Ilori and his war chiefs to establish effective British rule. By 1900, the Nupe and Ilorian and Yola Emirates had all fallen. Zaria was friendly and went down without a fight. The Emir of Kotangora refused to stop slave trading and famously said, You cannot stop a cat from mousing. When I die, it will be with a slave in my mouth. He was deposed. Because of the treaties that the Royal Niger Company had signed with Salkwato, the British claimed all of the Caliphate and declared a protectorate over the north. This infuriated the Sultan. He had understood the monies paid to him and his predecessors as taxes from a vassal, not subsidies or grants from a protecting power as intended by the British. He therefore cut off diplomatic ties and became increasingly hostile to the British. Such was the situation Lugard met in 1900. Britain had claims over most of the Caliphate, but would have to fight for effective control of it. Since then, Kano was now out of the way and Katsina and Gwandu surrendered without the fight. Salkuto was the final piece on the table. Lord Lugard received a letter of war from Salkuto with a passive indifference. One way or another, the showdown had always seemed inevitable. He genuinely wanted peace, not particularly for any benevolent reasons, but because it was a less expensive option. And he had to hurry now before the French, who were quite close by, seized this opportunity. As a matter of fact, he wasn't at all interested in intervening in the religious setup of the Caliphate. The British preferred to rule indirectly through already established structures and bureaucracy, and fewer nations were better organised than the Caliphate. The year was 1903, and all pretenses at diplomacy and civility was now cast aside. It was time for a decisive battle to determine, once and for all, the fate of the Caliphate. Lugard had been an army man since age 20. He was particular about things being done his way, and he had learnt a lot from recent battles. His West African frontier force was well trained, they were veterans of many wars, including the recently concluded Ashanti Wars. He knew his enemy well. He had perfected the infantry square formation as the answer to the problem of the Fulani cavalry. He knew to stay out of the range of arrows and that his cannons outranged anything that Salkoto could throw at him. He realised he would be severely outnumbered and that he must take up a defensive stance. But he had trust in his men, his guns and his methods. But Lugard wasn't the only one with intel. In Atahiru's war council, preparations were being finalised as well. 
They knew how the British fought. They usually began with an artillery bombardment before advancing in square formation and using machine guns from range. They did this at Kano and managed to breach one of the smaller gates. At Kwatakwashi, the enemy formed up tight and was able to concentrate his fire effectively at advancing horsemen. Their plan was simple, prevent at any costs the enemy cannons from coming close enough to bombard the city and to strike hard and fast with cavalry to disrupt his formation. With the massive advantage in numbers, mobility and the will of God, victory would be theirs. It was the morning of 15th of March 1903. The aides of March had come, but definitely not passed. The green banner of the Sakoto Caliphate streamed in the sunlight as the men took up their positions. The mood was mixed. 100 years had passed since the founding of the Caliphate and the prophecy from Dan Fodio himself had predicted it would last only a century. Others were hopeful in the arrival of a Mahdi to save the day. The air was pregnant with nervous energy, but the horses were steady and the men quiet. To avoid bombardment of the city, the Salkoto cavalry had left the protection of the city walls and formed up outside the city, ready to attack. Caliph Muhammad Atahiru commanded the center. Muhammad Maiturari on the right and Ibrahim Sakin Raba on the left. They would have numbered at least 15,000 horsemen and many infantry. They were armed with lances, spears and Dane guns. The West African Frontier Force, on the other hand, was about 800 strong with four Maxim machine guns capable of firing 500 bullets per minute. They also had four cannons. They formed up in tight square formations. To the staring drone of Kaka, keys and drums ringing, the first charge was unleashed, riding fearlessly into the rapid guns of the adversary. The cavalry charge was swift and powerful, but unfortunately, not swift enough to avoid the barrage of bullets volleyed at them. They were never able to close the gap to Lugard's lines in significant force. Any who were in cut down on the way simply charged through the gaps in the squares along corridors of fire and death. Again and again they withdrew, reformed and charged, probing for weaknesses and soft spots in the enemy lines, but the coordinated fire and discipline of the colonial troops withstood each wave. Casualties mounted very quickly, and it was becoming clearer that their position was becoming untenable. The experienced General Marafa Maiturari and Waziri Bukhari galloped over to Caliph at Tahiru to convince him of the need to withdraw. Do you think this is my first battle? He said to us, snapped back in frustration. Nevertheless, the Caliph and his entire force withdrew, leaving countless dead on the fields outside the city. The only option now was Hitra. Salkuta was deserted as most decided to follow their caliph into exile. Knowing that the logistics were going to be quite difficult and with the major roads being watched by the British, Atahiru released his followers from the Oath of Allegiance and a significant portion of his followers, led by the Waziri and the Marafa, eventually went back to the city and formally surrendered. Such was the dismay the despair and sense of confliction that the Waziri wrote an essay explaining his decision. In it, we find that he based his decisions on the edicts of Dan Folio, and he consulted with eminent scholars of his day who pointed out precedents from the Abbasid Caliphate which in 1258 had its capital Baghdad sacked by the Mongol Golden Horde of Hulegu Khan. He surmised that it was permissible for Muslims to leave a clear conscience on the pagan rulers so long as they paid them only lip service. This document, the Risalat, survives to this day. Another great grandson of Dan Fodio was installed as Sultan of Salkoto, but the Caliphate was for all purposes in its death throes. The last breath of resistance, however, was far from spent, as the deposed Caliph Atahiru continued on his hijra. Thousands flocked under his banner as they made their way eastward. The British decided to hunt him down and to put an end to the struggle once and for all. The last stand was in Burmi. The Caliph and a great many host of men and nobles camped within the city and fortified it. The British arrived on the 27th of May 1903. This time there will be no massed cavalry charges. The battle began at 11am with the thundering of cannons and the staccato of machine gun fire. 
the defenders on the walls fought desperately. Some are said to have tied themselves together to prevent one another from fleeing. Such was the intensity of their conviction to fight. When the walls were breached and the savage street fighting that followed, every yard taken by the advancing invaders was stained red and taken over the dead bodies of the defenders. By evening, only the mosque remained. In it, the caliph and his closest supporters. The evening prayers were said, and as Atahiro looked round the hall, looking back to him with steely calm in the eyes, were men who had accepted that their time had come. This century-old tale was drawing to a finale, but they will write the last few lines themselves, bitten and battered, but not broken. Each and every one of them, the Ubandona, Nan Mogaji, Sarkin Kwani, the Alkali, and three of his own songs. The last defences were breached, and at the turn of a hundred years, the end began with this last stand. It was brief, but it was fierce, and it was proud, and it was noble. Caliphate had finally breathed his last. The empire ended as it had begun, with the Caliph and his convictions, surrounded by the unquestioning devotion of his men, with love and sacrifice, with blood and death, but with life anew too, and the promise of hope for a better hundred years to come. The May Warno a son of Muhammad Atahiro managed to flee with some followers to present-day Sudan, where the descendants still live. Epilogue Unknown numbers died at Burmi, estimates are in the thousands. Images of the dead caliph were propagated around the defeated emirates. The remnants of the Caliphate accepted British rule, and the new government promised to preserve the freedom of religion and non-interference with religious matters. At-Tahiru Muhammad II was crowned Sultan by the British colonial authority, and the Caliphate was abolished. The new Northern Protectorate was merged with British holdings south of River Niger in 1914 to form what is present-day Nigeria. The sultans of Salkoto up until today have all been direct descendants of Uthman Dan Fodio and are still revered in Nigeria as spiritual leaders and as a leading Muslim figure. And that is the end of the series. It's been absolutely fantastic having you guys around for the entirety of the um, run. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it as much as I have um, preparing it for you. Um, next up would be a series on the history of Lagos. Again, it's um, material that is already available on my YouTube um, page, but I am adapting it for um, the podcast, uh, the Aquilani History Podcast. So thank you so much for sticking around. Thanks for your thoughts, your um, ideas, suggestions, feedback. Um, it means a lot to me. And I'm just going to implore once more um, for your help. Um, it's um, a one-man show. I'm doing the research. I'm doing the writing. I'm doing the editing, sound mixing, pretty much everything. So your support goes a long way for me um to keep on putting out um um content like this so if you do like um what you've heard so far and you'd want to hear some more of this please um like um subscribe um follow this podcast share uh tell everyone you know about it and it would go a long 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 way to um help support me so thank you very much and um be well, everyone, and I hope to see you 
real soon. Stay safe.